I'm going to read to you two verses of Scripture here, found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says here, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You can see my fancy little side note here. It says Illuminati, Skull and Bones, Mason, CFR, etc. Council on Foreign Relations is what that stands for. Now, <clears throat> I know many of you, as my viewers, are aware of the conspiracy, if you will, the satanic conspiracy, people that actually worship the devil in exchange for money and power and fame, all of that. Um, some of you might not understand that yet. Some of you might be new to this whole thing of understanding that there are these people that do exactly what the devil offered to Jesus Christ right there. The devil said to Jesus, if you fall down and worship me, I will give you all the power of these kingdoms and, kingdoms and everything else there. And, um, and Jesus, of course, rebukes him and he says in the next verse there, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But a lot of people that the devil offers that to, they take him up on it. And uh, recently got the video done about Jack Hiles and the Hiles-Anderson system and, the, and uh, Russell Anderson, uh, this guy that co-founded the, um, the Hiles-Anderson College. You know, it's, it's named you know, after Jack Hiles and this man named Russell Anderson. And if you've seen that video, you saw Russell Anderson speaking at Jack Hiles' birthday party, and he's bragging about how much money he has. And I showed some other documentation on that. And uh, the point is, the guy's very wealthy. And um, so we just, you know, we were talking about this thing, and, and we got on the subject of the Bohemian Grove. And now, again, you might not know what that is if you don't understand that. Um, the Bohemian Grove is a secret. Uh, club for men only, very rich, powerful men that meets out in California, out in the Redwood Groves, and they have this giant owl, some people say Minerva, and other people Moloch, and, and there's other names people have for this owl, and they do a mock human sacrifice, and actually if uh, you study the Franklin cover-up, the Franklin scandal that happened back in Omaha, Nebraska years and years ago, uh, in that book written by John DeCamp, it actually talks about how that one of those sacrifices that was done was actually the body of a real boy that had been molested and then murdered. And they actually burned the body. And it's really weird that they come out in these outfits and they, you know, druidic outfits and they, they do this really odd ceremony and everything about the cremation of care. In other words, killing their conscience, essentially. Um, because when you get up into the highest levels of business, uh, it's kind of like the old saying, Business is kind of a lot like a pond. The scum always rises to the top. In other words, you have to do a lot of cutting, you know, people's throats and, and cutting corners and, and outbidding people and destroying other, you know, destroy your competition to be successful. That's how you succeed in this world. Um, the more satanic you are, the more you are willing to serve Satan, the higher up in the business realm you'll get. Um, very few Christians have ever been overly wealthy. All right. And you say, what about King Solomon? Well, first of all, King Solomon wasn't a Christian. Secondly, um, the women that he had as his wives, as a result of all of his money, uh, they turned his heart away from God. So, so by the time you get to the end of his life, you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he's saying, what good was it all? You know, he had everything. He had he had more money than people can even dream of today. Real money, you know, gold and silver and things like that, treasures, uh, not just fiat currencies that are printed on paper or digital currency that's just a number on a computer. Uh, King Solomon had real money, and it messed him up. So it's not something that God gives you know, to people. Again, another good saying to remember is, you know what God thinks of money by the kind of people he gives it to. Okay, interesting. Let's look at a couple other verses of Scripture here. We... We're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now, if you understand the King James Bible word mammon, mammon is a reference to money. 
Okay, it's kind of like a, a false god name for money. You know, this, this false god of mammon. So you can't serve God and mammon. And you'll find that out in life. You get into ministry. You can't be in ministry for the money. Okay? I can attest to that, that there are times when you will have financial difficulty. As Paul said back in the book of Philippians, you know, he learned how to, how to be abased and how to abound, you know. I think is how it says it. Philippians chapter 4, I believe, is where that's at. But, uh, you know, he's, he's learned to, you know, abound and to, to suffer need. Uh, we'll look up that verse here in a minute. But, you know, the point is, when you are serving the Lord, you're not going to be very wealthy. But let's continue here. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Down here it says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So there Jesus said it again. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are... They which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is, a, is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now, if you are a multimillionaire, are you highly esteemed among men? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh we have a millionaire in the room here. Wow. What about a multimillionaire? Oh, that's even better. Well, if it's highly esteemed among men... The Bible says it's an abomination in the sight of God. Now think about that. Think about how the Bible is so easy to understand, how Scripture ties together with Scripture. All right? You have men serving Satan, bowing the knee to Satan in exchange for money and power. And the Bible says when you have lots of money and power, you're an abomination in the sight of God. Pretty easy to work that thing out in your mind, okay? You serve Satan to get money and power, and when you get to that position, you're an abomination in the sight of God. Easy to figure out. Unless your name's Russell Anderson. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 4. I'll show you the verses I was talking about here. This is the mark of a Christian that's serving the Lord. Verses 11 and 12, he says here, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. We'll see that again in a minute here, next passage that we go to. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it isn't just if you're in full-time ministry. Okay, I'm saying that, you know, I've been doing this now for quite a few years and, and there are rough times that you go through and, and things and, and you learn how to abound sometimes. The donations come in, the Lord takes care of it. And, you know, I just want to say that too. Uh, it's very interesting. The Lord actually will take care of the amount of donations that come in. There are certain times that we will get, you know, in kind of a bind and we have some big bill come up or whatever else and the Lord puts it in the heart of, of people and I don't, I mean, watch my videos. I'm not begging for money and saying, please, please, please send money. Please, you have to send money. Hey, if you've been blessed by the ministry, donate. If not, forget about it. If the Lord doesn't put it on your heart, don't worry about it. You know, there's no section on my website that you have to be a member, special paid monthly member to get into this section or none of that stuff. What happens is the Lord places it into the heart of people out there. I want to donate something to the ministry. And I mean, there have been times literally I'm like, we're going to have to sell some possessions or something here, you know, uh, sell some things or, uh, you know, we really don't have much in the way of savings. <laughs> but, you know, we'll have to just totally deplete all of our savings to pay such and such bill. You know, uh, it happened a lot when we were moving, you know, having to pay these big bills of moving from Pennsylvania to Maine. And, you know, just these bills come up and it's just like all of a sudden just a donation shows up right at that exact time takes care of the bill. I mean, I, there has been so many times I lost count now where I have to go do some shopping, some food shopping or whatever, get some things uh, for the ministry, some, you know, ink for the printer and, and whatever else, uh, accessories for the computer. 
And I'll be like, well, you know, yeah, we have the money for it, but it's going to make things a little bit difficult. And I will go leave the ministry headquarters, go to the post office, and there will be somebody sent uh, some cash or some a check or something like that, and it's the exact amount that we need. It's amazing. And that has happened time and time and time again. Why? The Lord is the one that takes care of what I make in a year when you're in ministry. Okay? And like I was saying earlier, before I went off on a little rabbit trail there, even if you just have a, a job and whatever else, you know, we're going to see this in this little study here on, on Russell Anderson. You know, it's this, oh, I, I just work construction and I was really successful and God really blessed me. And, and I'm a multimillionaire from doing drywall and trucking and owning apartments and stuff like this. And yet, I know a lot of guys that work in construction. I never worked in construction. I was a cabinet maker and I was a logger for a little while. You know, and you work hard and you work hard and you work hard. And you say, you know, could you eventually become a millionaire from this? No, <laughs> it's not going to happen. You know, and the Illuminati likes to do these rags to riches stories. But... I don't want to get ahead of myself. But you will see this thing as a Christian. You learn both how to abound and how to suffer need sometimes. All right. Bible talks back in the book of Proverbs about giving me neither riches nor poverty. You know, just providing for you. I mean, again, think about it, folks. You know, the rapture is going to happen. Everything that you have is going to be left to somebody else. So why amass some huge amount of fortune? Somebody else is going to get it. You aren't going to have it saved for you so that you can have it when you come back, you know, after the time of Jacob's trouble. Go next to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop there for a minute. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say? You cannot serve God and mammon, that which is highly esteemed among men, is abomination in the sight of God. Hmm, interesting. Let's continue. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness... From such, withdraw thyself. Look out for that one. God's prospered me. I'm a multimillionaire because of God. Eh, careful. Verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Now look at this, verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. In other words, they that will be rich. Those people that make making, they, they have a goal to make a lot of money. Those people there, they will fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Interesting. Verse 10, the infamous verse 10 here. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So, does that speak highly of a Christian businessman? No. I mean, you can be in business as a Christian, you know, man, but uh, when you're starting to get up into the multi-millions of dollars, it's kind of a problem. The Bible's not real uh, positive on that subject there. Let me show you a picture here. This is um, the Independent Baptist Conference. This was back in 2012, but I want to illustrate something here. Here you can see the picture of it. Let me... Uh, Zoom in here to a little bit more detail. In Independent Baptist Conference, look at the blue lettering there. Here we grow again. Supposing that gain is godliness. Hmm. And, you know, why do these guys want to grow? So they can build bigger Bible buildings, get in more people, get more money. 
don't kid me, man. You know, the, oh, that's not what it's about, Brother Brian. You know, it's not, a, it's not about that, you know. And what do we have down here? Um, here in the bottom right corner, what has been done can be done. John R. Rice, Jack Hiles, and Russell Anderson down there at the bottom. So you see Russell Anderson down there. And Russell Anderson is one of the speakers. Okay, it says here, come here, a multimillionaire whom God has used to give $39 million to the work of God around the world. In the early 60s, he approached Dr. Jack Hiles about quitting the business world and getting, going into the ministry full time. At that time, he was worth $300,000. Dr. Hiles advised him to stay in business. He told Dr. Anderson, God needs a man that can prove to the world that you can stay in business and live a fruitful Christian life. Okay, I'll get right back to that in a minute here. He did and has reproduced himself, and now we need another. Bring your layman and see if you may not have your own Russell Anderson. Okay. A couple points need to be made here. Number one, Hiles, Wiley, there, jerk Wiles, <laughs> Jack Hiles, he says, quote, God needs a man that can prove to the world that you can stay in business and live a fruitful Christian life. Jesus Christ said you cannot serve God and mammon. Well, who's right? Well, Jack Hiles, I'm sure. You know, Jesus didn't, he just didn't understand things the way that Jack Hiles did. You know, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is proud knowing nothing like Jack Hiles. Oh, yeah. And, you know, why do you want to go to hear the guy? Come hear a multi-millionaire. Oh, wow. Let's go hear a multi-millionaire. This is of the Lord? Sure it is. But uh, here's where it gets kind of interesting. Because we were talking about this whole thing, my wife and I. And, um, and I said, you know what? I remember uh, Fritz Springmeier's book. Let me show it here on camera. Uh, Fritz Springmeier's book. Here it is, Bloodlines of the Illuminati by Fritz Springmeier. And I remembered that he actually had in the back a list of the members of the Bohemian Grove. And I thought, well, what is the Bohemian Grove? It's these rich men that dedicate themselves to Satan. They go out there to do the cremation of care, and there's all kinds of fornication and pedophilia and all kinds of sodomy and all other stuff going on. And these guys go out there, they, they go through all these odd ceremonies and stuff like this, and are basically selling their souls to Satan in exchange for money and power. And of course, you know, the Masonic Lodge and the Illuminati and the, all this stuff, it's, a, it's a, the old boys network where these guys, they network with each other and, hey, I'll give you a good deal. And it, See, it's the way that you make lots of money. And if you can make enough money to give away $39 million, like Russell Anderson claims, right there in this Bathlick, uh, you know, seminar thing that he's going to be speaking at, you know, if you can make enough money to give that, you know, $39 million away, you got some connections. Don't tell me he worked that, you know, I worked hard to make this kind of money. Bull. Nonsense. Okay. Absolute total nonsense. Let me show you here. So we looked up the thing of the membership list of the Bohemian Grove. Let me show you here, page 496. Look up here in the top left-hand corner. R. Anderson. Hmm. You say, what's the first name? I don't know. I have no idea. We couldn't find that information. You say, well, that doesn't prove that it's Russell Anderson, Brian. It doesn't prove it. Yeah, but it doesn't prove that it's not Russell Anderson. It could be Russell Anderson. I don't know. And again, this is I'm just showing you. Here, you can make up your own mind. But the fact that these rich, powerful elites go out there to California to do all this stuff and these weird rituals and things, you know, I'll just say it wouldn't shock me if Russell Anderson was going to the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you have to be connected to this system, the Illuminati, the Masons. You have to be connected to that thing. And I'm going to show you proof a little bit later that he definitely was connected to the Masons. I can't document, I can't prove that that is 
him there that was at the Bohemian Grove. But I can show you that he was part of the Masons. We're going to show you that later on. And I think he's got some other connections too, by the way. But, uh, you know, you just, you got to keep this thing in mind. The words of Jesus Christ say that you can't serve God and mammon. Okay, all through the Bible. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. There, there's all kinds of problems with this thing of money. King Solomon got messed up because of his power and his wealth. It messed him up. Okay, it's just... So you get, oh, I served God and he made me a multi-millionaire. And you can come, you know, hear the guy speak, you know, bring your layman and see if you may not have your own Russell Anderson. Yeah. Okay. But uh, let me show you a couple other things here. Some in interesting things. My wife did a little bit of research. She's pretty good at uh, digging up things and, and stuff like that from her past uh, experience in the military. But I'm going to be saying some more things too a little bit later on. Some other things that, that uh, she's been researching and finding out about another Anderson, but um, she found a book that was actually written by Jack Scapp's wife, Cindy, who was the daughter of Jack Hiles. Cindy Hiles, and then she became Cindy Scapp. And it's interesting because she wrote this book, uh, like a biography of uh, Russell Anderson. Look at the name of the book. From the coal mines to the gold mines. you got to get that gold lettering on there too, you know, and really make it look rich and, and everything else. Boy, no pride there, you know. I started out as a coal miner and, and you know, later I've, you know, like a gold mine. I'm a very wealthy man, multimillionaire. Sure, and he got there by hard work, right? Hard work with the right crowd, I imagine. But uh, just going to show you a couple things in here, and you can make up your own mind what you think one way or the other. I thought this was kind of interesting. Five points sum up the life of Dr. Russell Anderson, millionaire and philanthropist. Ooh, okay, that's something that's very, uh, the Illuminati does that a lot. They'll say, I'm a philanthropist, you know. I mean, you'll get a lot of these big guys in the Illuminati, and they believe in the thing of duality also, by the way. As above, so below. They do that. The, the yin and the yang. Balancing positive with negative. All this stuff. And so they will finance the world government, but then they'll also finance cancer research or something, which is evil in itself. But, you know, they'll finance good causes. They'll give money to good causes. The Rockefeller Foundation, you know, they'll give money to good causes. Then they give money to the evil. You know, they have to balance it, this duality thing. And, and they'll often call themselves a philanthropist. You know, fancy word just meaning that they give money to good causes. But look at this. <clears throat> work hard. This is five-point thing here. Work hard. You can, number two, you cannot outgive God. Number three, give yourself away. Number four, do right by people. And number five, give. Okay? And it talks about him making all kinds of money down there, you know. Now... You say, why bring that up? Well, very interesting, because if you understand the Illuminati, specifically the higher levels of it, they have the thing of the law of fives. And you'll see this thing um, where they have, I don't remember, I don't have the thing memorized, but Adam Vieshop, the founder of the Illuminati, who was a Jesuit, the Jesuits, you know, were originally called the Illuminated, and then they came out with the Society of Jesus, and changed, they changed their name to that. Um, but... Adam Vieshaupt came up with a thing of five, a five-step program to bring, to destroy a society and bring it back under control of uh, a world government, essentially. And so the Illuminati, men in the Illuminati, have done this thing of the law of fives. Now, what is a Roman numeral for five? It is a V. So you can go like this and symbolize the law of fives. And many men have done that that are in the Illuminati. They'll specifically go like this, you know, to hold both hands up. You say, oh no, Brian, that means peace. It means peace. Well, if you're uninitiated, yeah, it means peace. It can mean all kinds of different things. And it's also a satanic salute because, again, you have the two horns of Satan above the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. See? 
So if you get a guy going like this, like Jack Hiles did many, many times, hmm, interesting too because you have Rick Warren talking about his five-step peace plan. And if you study the number five in the Bible, it's the number of death. Hmm. And the fifth month of the year, May, is when the Illuminati was founded. It's all coincidence. Don't dare try to tie this stuff together, okay? That's conspiracy theory. You know, and you say, well, Brian, maybe he didn't mean that. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he's not a member of the Bohemian Grove. Maybe he didn't mean anything by the five thing here. I'm just presenting you some facts and you can make up your own mind. I want to show you another thing that's interesting here. Um, <clears throat> go to page 90 in this book. You say, well, Brian, this guy's a, he's a Bible-believing, King James Bible-believer, man. What are, you, what are you being so rough on him for? Well, because the whole Hiles Anderson cult produces this phony, easy-believism thing where they just get people to pray prayers and it's about getting in the numbers, getting in the money. It's, it's a business. That's why he's so interested in it. You say, well, Brian, it's not about money with them. Really? Let's look here, page 90. See it down there, page 90. Little triangle too there, it's kind of telling. <clears throat> Russell Anderson began paying 10 students from Kevin Wine's college to go soul winning after school each day. Paid soul winners, huh? The money kept them from having to work a second job. Soul winning became their second job. Now around 200 college students in foreign countries are paid by Dr. Anderson to make soul winning their second job. The students keep finding new territory and seeing more and more souls saved. Hmm. The students bring back their reports to Dr. Wine and he gives them to Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson increased his soul winning impact by beginning to send money to missionary Rick Martin, another Hiles Anderson college graduate in the Philippines. Dr. Anderson hires soul winners in Brother Martin's ministry, as well as sending money to hire soul winners in the countries of Haiti and Africa. Each soul winner receives $40 a week, the equivalent to a generous week's wages in these countries. Well, praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that we have paid soul winners? So the more people you go out and uh, con and... <clears throat> I'm sorry. I meant, <laughs> I meant save. The more people you go out and you get them to pray this silly prayer, you know, without any repentance, without any changed life, without any talking to them, explaining to them what salvation means, explaining the, what the Bible talks about sin. Are you a sinner? Have you sinned against God? No, no, no. Don't do that. Just do you want to go to heaven when you die? Well, I don't know. Oh, you have to go to heaven when you die. If you want to go to heaven, just pray this prayer. Repeat after me. You get people to pray the prayer. You go one, two, three, four, five, sixty people saved today. That's what these guys are doing. You say, well, Brian, you can't prove that. Oh, sure I can. Sure I can. Because you see, I've seen that mentality. And they talk about, we've led millions of people to the Lord. Millions of people to the Lord. Okay. Well, there's a very simple test that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave us. And that is, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Okay. We've had millions of people saved here from the Hiles Anderson cult. Where's the fruit? Boy, we should see revival, shouldn't we? I mean, the Bible <clears throat> talks about 3,000 people getting saved on the day of Pentecost, and they turned the world upside down with 3,000 people. Now, a lot of these wing nuts from Hiles Anderson, like Dr. Bob Gray, he said that he's led personally over 1.1 million or something like that people to the Lord. Okay, where's the fruit? We'll just go with his numbers. One million plus people saved through his preaching. All right, one million people down there in Texas, I think it is, they're saved. Where's the fruit? One million, one million Bible-believing Christians out there. Hey, man, that ought to produce some fruit, shouldn't it? It's not there. You know why? It's not legitimate. It's not real. They're getting people to pray prayers. And as you saw, if, if you've seen my study on Jack Hiles, you know that that's the case. One, two, three, pray after me, you know. Pray the prayer, and then you just count the numbers and stuff like this. See? Hey, you're getting paid to do it. You know? 
the more numbers you can get in, the more people you can pray to you get to pray the little silly prayer. Hey, man, you know, hey, let's get these people in. Let's get the numbers in here, man. I'll make more money. Send the reports back and show I'm really zealous for winning souls. And this is of the Lord. And by the way, if you are a member of the Illuminati, a Satanist, whatever, somebody that's actually worshiping the devil, what would be the best way to damn people? Get them to pray a false prayer of salvation thinking that they're saved when they're not. That's the best way to people send people to hell. Because then a real soul winner comes along and says, hey, are you saved? Well, of course I'm saved. How do you know? I prayed a prayer. You know? I'll, I'll never forget. We went. We were going out door to door. You know, the one time uh, me and, and a, a brother of mine, you know, saved brother I'm talking about, and we went out and we talked to this guy and we said, are you saved? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm saved. We said, uh, well, do you think or do you know? He said, well, I guess I know. And we said, how do you know? He said, uh, well, the, the pastor at my wife's church told me I'm saved. And we talked to the guy a little bit. He wasn't saved. The guy was totally lost. Had no, absolutely no idea what salvation even meant. You know? And finally he admitted, yeah, I'm not saved. And he's like, I actually, I just had a heart attack. And, you know, I'm a little bit worried about going to hell when I die. He wasn't saved. And how many millions of people have has this cult done this to? This, this Jack Hiles, Russell Anderson cult. Disgusting. So you have paid soul winning. You know, and of course, again, think of think of the return on investment. You know, again, watch the video that I did about uh, Jack Hiles there. I think it was part three. And Russell Anderson says, you know, there's a three syllable word called dividends. And he said, I like that. He said, I like the two syllable word money. I like that. Now think about this. Russell Anderson is putting all these millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars into Babel buildings and getting people coming into those Babel buildings. And you get all those people tithing. That's a good return on investment, buddy. Real good money. You make out real well. That's what it's about. It's money. Love of money. So, let me show you a couple other things. You say, well, Brian, uh, you really think he loves money that much? Oh, yeah. How about uh, page 151? There you have it. It says here, he recently made a lot of money by investing in United Airlines. The company was struggling financially. Stocks were down. And Dr. Anderson invested in several shares. After declaring bankruptcy, United stock went up, went way up, excuse me, and Dr. Anderson profited financially. A similar circumstance took place with Ford Motor Company. Dr. Anderson profited much from his investments in the General Electric Company. Now, if you, again, if you don't know about this, this is called insider trading. All right, you get into the power structure, into the Illuminati, into the Bilderbergers or, or Bohemian Grove or whoever, the, the, the Masons, high-level Masons, and they will do this. They will raise up companies, and then they will tear them down. And what you do is you uh, buy stock in companies, basically. Like it says here, it talks about um, the company was struggling financially, stocks were down, and Dr. Anderson invested in several shares. So you wait till they're making, they're, they're having trouble, and they're like, what are we going to do? You know, we need investments and stuff. We need investors. So you go in and you buy the stock cheap and then the company folds and you sell it and make a huge profit. Make a lot of money. There was a lot of insider trading with the whole 9-11 thing. You know, before 9-11, there were some stocks that were starting to go down. Some of the trade tower stocks and things were coming down. And all these rich, wealthy, big men were buying up all the stocks and then when 9-11 happened, now that these companies go bust or whatever else, and they, they're selling these stocks, and they make millions and millions of dollars. Well, there's only one of two possibilities for that. Number one, you have to know that these companies are going to fall. Number two, you have to wager and just say, oh, it was good luck. Just the right place at the right time. Kind of like saying, you know, I'm a multimillionaire that started out working in the coal mines. And I'm not saying that he didn't work in a coal mine. He probably did. But see, again, they'll do that. Um, another good example would be Teddy Roosevelt. 
Teddy Roosevelt was born, he was one of the Illuminati families. He was born into the Illuminati. And Teddy Roosevelt, you know, was worked in ranching for a little bit out west and, and did a little bit of logging type of stuff like that too. You know, they'll they'll get in and act like, oh, see, I'm a I'm a I'm a regular guy and I've worked my way up to six, be successful. And that you have the average man is working his way up and he's a hard worker too, and yet he never becomes a multimillionaire. Not worshiping the uh, God of this world, I would imagine. Yeah. So again, you have inter insider trading that Russell Anderson is involved in. Or just really good luck, you know? Sure. Show you another thing here. Uh, page 64. Just looking at my notes. You say, Brian, earlier you said about um, that you can prove, that you can document that uh, Russell Anderson is a Mason. Yeah, I can. You see, if you saw the Jack Hiles study and you saw at the very beginning, um, there was a memorial erected to honor Jack Hiles. And if you know anything about the occult, and again, I'm sorry I have to explain this, but in the occult, in the, in the Masonic Lodge, their god is the male sexual organ, okay? And it is uncircumcised, and so they have this, they erect statues called obelisks, Masonic obelisks. The, the probably most well-known in the world is the, is the Washington Monument. You also have the obelisk in St. Peter's Square over there in front of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, these obelisks are all over the world. And they are a um, symbolic thing of the Masonic resurrection. All right. I'm not going to get into that. You can watch my other studies if you don't know about that. But this is, it is a Masonic symbol. And it is, I believe it is the symbol that Nebuchadnezzar, the image that he raised up and the children of Israel were supposed to bow down to it. They believe in circumcision. And here you have this statue of an uncircumcised phallus there. And they're supposed to bow down to the thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They play the music and they're just like, we are not bound to that. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, and of course they, you know, the whole story there about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you don't read the book of Daniel, you can see it there. But the point is, this symbol has been used for thousands of years. Okay. This obelisk, it is a Masonic occult symbol. There's no question about that. If you saw the Jack Hiles study, you see, you saw there that there is a Masonic obelisk there to honor Jack Hiles. Now, I thought that it was put up posthumously. In other words, after Jack Hiles died, I thought that that's when the Masonic obelisk was, was erected. Not so. Let me show you. Here you have page uh, 64 from the uh, coal mines to the gold mines. There you have Jack Hiles standing beside the memorial. Hmm. It's a picture, two pictures of my dad, this is Cindy Scapp writing this, with the monument erected in his honor in Italy, Texas. Dr. Anderson is seated to his immediate right. Right there is Russell Anderson. On August 27, 1974, a monument was erected, see they use the term, in honor of my father on the east end of his hometown in Italy, Texas. My dad was 48. The monument was a gift da -da 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 -da, from Dr. Anderson. Six foot granite monument. Interesting number. Six foot tall. Hmm. And there she is, Cindy Scapp. There at the time, Cindy Hiles. So this thing was put up in 1974. Long, long, long before Jack Hiles died. Now, of course, we can make a couple little statements there. Why would a Christian preacher want anything to do with a monument putting, being put up in his honor? I mean, where is this at in the book of Acts? Where do you see any of the apostles, any of the early Christians saying, you know, 
Paul, we'd like to present you with this wonderful monument here because you're such a wonderful soul winner. How out of character for a Christian. It's not something that a Christian would want. So yeah, that is a problem. Number two, shouldn't the Holy Spirit have been there to kind of convict Jack Hiles and say, what's, it, what's this Masonic obelisk, you know, to, to honor me? Ugh, no, man, get that thing out of here. And, you know, I'm sure that Russell Anderson was just innocent and just kind of went into a, a company that made, you know, granite monuments and was just like, uh, what do you have? And they said, how about this one over here? It's a nice pointy thing. And, and he's like, that's pretty. Let's take that one. You really believe that? Well, maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> I believe it, you know, it, it obviously points to the fact that he's a Mason. Because the Masons are the ones that do this. I mean, you know, you can watch my, again there, my uh, video on uh, paganism and things in Lancaster County. And my wife and I, we, we drove around and, and things and went to these different graveyards and they have these obelisks. Almost all of them were Masons. Openly had the Masonic square and compass. You know, which is a, is, it's a stylized hexagram. And the G is the god of masonry that's in the middle. You know, it's a sex symbol, the the downward pointing triangle is the female, the upward pointing triangle is the male, and the G inside is the god of Freemasonry. It's generativity. It's, it's the male phallus. That's why you have the obelisk. That's why the Masons wear the white apron there around that part of their body. It's, it's the veil separating the outside world from the holy of holies to a Mason. Again, I mean, you can study this stuff. This, this is, this is documented fact. I mean, watch Bill Schneblin's stuff on the, the, um, his, you know, former life as a Mason, you know, before he was saved, you know. But Russell Anderson is a Christian, right? Let me show you something else that's I, I thought was rather interesting. My wife was uh, doing some looking around, and she found this picture here of uh, Russell Anderson. And uh, there in the, in the blue or whatever kind of aqua collared coat. And you have Bob Gray, Dr. Bob Gray, a graduate of Hiles Anderson. And uh, look right behind him on the wall there. Kind of an interesting thing to have on the wall. You know, and you say, oh, Brian, it's just decoration. It's just, you know, it's just a wall ornament or something. Well, you could make that argument, but you could also make the argument that it looks like a Catholic monstrance. And that these guys, oftentimes, they'll do this. They'll put circles around the head or behind the head or kind of up like this to prove godhood. I'm sure that he wouldn't do a thing like that, though. You know. And Russell Anderson, there was another thing we read that Russell Anderson gave Bob Gray a million dollars because Bob Gray was such a great soul winner. Hmm. Interesting. And, of course, if you understand the Masonic the Illum uh, Masonic Lodge, the Illuminati, all this stuff, it all goes back to Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism, you know, controls all these different organizations. So, very interesting. Let me show you another piece of evidence here, which I find to be very interesting. Again, you know, this one, again, I, I'm just going to show it to you. You can make up your own mind. Page uh, 412 here in Bloodlines of the Illuminati. You can see down here the House of Bruce was accompanied by other bloodlines such as Boswell, uh, Brody, Cameron, Campbell, Fraser, Graham, hmm, and Hamilton. Okay, remember the name Hamilton. And by the way, let me just explain something there. If you're going, what does this mean? These Illuminati guys will oftentimes, it's kind of like if you're born into a Christian family, you know, and your parents teach you about the Bible and they, they you know, teach you the old hymns and whatever else. The Illuminati is the same way, but on the reverse. You're raised in, the, you know, brought up to, to be a Satanist, essentially, you know. And so there are the really higher powers, the higher up families in the Illuminati will marry and intermarry with one another, keeping the money and the power within the family. Okay. 
Let's look at here at page 14. Again, Russell Anderson's book here, The Coal Mines of the Gold Mines. Lady Mar Mary Hamilton, daughter of the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Ireland, was engaged to a man who was chosen to buy her father. She did not want to marry, blah, 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 blah. You know, married an Anderson. And this is the ancestor of Russell Anderson. So he comes from the Hamilton family. The Hamilton family was tied in with the Illuminati. Now you say, was he a direct descendant of, you know, these Hamiltons and things? I don't know as far as, you know, maybe it was a different, different Hamilton. Maybe it wasn't one that was involved with the Illuminati, but uh, maybe it was. I don't know. Let me show you something else that's rather uh, interesting. You say, well, uh, Brian, I thought when I saw this video, I thought it was about Steven Anderson, you know. Well, it wasn't totally about Steven Anderson, but um, let me show you something else interesting here in the Bloodlines of the Illuminati book. Here you have the Kennedy bloodline. And down here, some of the different families that uh, they abound with marriages to names such as, and it goes down through, and you have Humphreys. Over here we have the Humphrey Illuminati families. Hmm, tied in with the Rockefellers. What about the Humphreys? Let me show you a little video clip here when uh, Stephen Anderson went out to actually document who some of his ancestors were. Check this out. All right, so as I said, this is the tombstone of George Humphreys, who is my great, great, great grandfather, born in 1842, died in 1922. What I'm going to do now is take a rubbing of the tombstone. So I got my crayon and a piece of paper. Put that on there like that. There you have it. You say, now, Brian, that doesn't prove anything. So what? He's got a Humphrey. So, so what? What's the big deal? You know? So what? Okay, yeah. His name's Anderson. Russell Anderson's name is Anderson. You know? Can you prove a direct link? No, I can't. I can't. And maybe, you know, Stephen Anderson's uh, ancestor there, the Humphrey, maybe they're not involved in the same family, the Humphreys there. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, I can prove one thing. There's no name Denlinger in here. <laughs> You know, my ancestors are Anabaptists. Go back for centuries as uh, Anabaptists. So, you know, my family is not at all tied to the Illuminati. But uh, there's some very interesting things about Stephen Anderson that, that uh, we're looking into right now. And um, my wife, like I said earlier, she's got a background in the military, uh, in the spook world. And uh, she is very good at finding information on people. And, uh, you know, I, I know that the Lord allowed her to go through that training as a lost woman so that he could use her for his glory now that she's saved. And uh, I just really thank the Lord for my wife because she, <laughs> she found a lot of this information on her own. I mean, she read this whole book, you know, and marked the pages and things on it. She's got a bunch of things marked. There's other stuff in here, by the way, too, I didn't even bring up. I mean, it's just, that guy's so crooked, this Russell Anderson, whatever. But uh, I have some very definite questions. There are some things that just don't line up with Stephen Anderson. And uh, some very odd things about his marriage and his wife coming here to America. Um, very strange. Uh, I've known a lot of people that have have tried to do the naturalization thing and, you know, being brought in, you know, to another country and, uh, you know, and it takes years sometimes. I knew a guy that, that uh, took like two or three years to get his wife here. She was from the Dominican Republic. It took like all this time to get her up here, you know. And Stephen Anderson, it's just like a matter of days, weeks, just meets his wife, boom. They they ran off and, and you know, got married at some 
little wedding chapel or something like that in, in uh, uh, Nevada, you know. This is something that a conservative Christian does. Families aren't even involved, just runs off and marries like that. You know, and, and again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be rough on him if it was like he admitted to it and he talked about it and stuff like this and, and was just like, yeah, I made some mistakes or whatever. But the guy is just so arrogant, you know, saying that sodomites should be executed and put to death and the president should be killed and all this other stuff. And he's coming out with all these heresies. And interesting, too, that uh, my wife found something else that was rather interesting, that uh, certain, you know, members of governmental agencies, uh, if they uh, want to bring somebody, get married to somebody from another country, that the whole naturalization process happens much quicker. Hmm. Interesting. And there's a bunch of other things that we're, you know, doing some digging and finding some things on Steven Anderson. And these things are going to be coming out um, because I'm convinced more and more that we look into the guy that he is a false prophet. And not just a false prophet, but I believe he's a uh, agent of Satan. And uh, like I said, we're going to bring, bring out some more things. And, and if anybody out there, if any of you out there know anything on Steven Anderson, um, let, me, let me know about it. Let us know about it. We would be interested in any information that you would have. Uh, proving some of the things, you know, some stuff about his past, you know, that, that uh, I don't know, interesting things. I don't want to give it away for what we have coming out in the future here. But uh, definitely some interesting things. Very interesting. But uh, as far as this Russell Anderson guy is concerned, just crooked. I mean, looking at all this information together, you know, I mean, there's just too many things that tie together that are standard operating procedure for members of the Illuminati. And it's just like something smells rotten with Russell Anderson. And you say, well, Brian, what, what does it matter? What's the big deal? Russell Anderson financed the whole Hiles Anderson College. Jack Hiles would have been nothing if it wasn't for Russell Anderson. And look at the system that these guys have created. They have twisted what Baptist used to stand for. The independent fundamental Baptist church system uh, has been essentially destroyed by Jack Hiles and his cult following. And now you have all these people that have been led into phony professions of salvation and uh, they're, they stick with it for a little while and then they come out and they're atheists. I mean, look it up. You can look it up right here on YouTube. Look up people that were former Hiles Anderson you know, members and uh, uh, students or whatever and First Baptist Church members. Now they're atheists. Now they hate God. Why? They were false converts. <laughs> Just incredible. But, um, like I said, I'm going to be coming out with some more information. Um, let me just say this. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people get kind of perturbed with maybe when I come out and I expose false prophets and false ministries and things. But, uh, brethren, that's my job. Okay? I do preach the Word, you know, and, and I do bring out a lot of studies on the Bible, and we go through the Bible a lot. But, you know, I'm not too concerned about corruption within the Methodist system or corruption within the Presbyterians or whatever. Um, the last bastion of orthodoxy, if you will, I hate to even use those terms, it sounds too religious. The, the last um, safe place for Christians is the King James Bible-believing movement. Uh, we are the last remnant of true believers that can give the light of the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. I'm not saying that there are people in other you know, movements and things and people that are using new versions. There are people that ignorantly use the new versions. I'm aware of that. They haven't heard the Bible version issue yet. They're struggling. They're on, their, they're on the journey to the truth. They're, the Lord is leading them out of certain things. I, I certainly don't say that you have to agree with me and everything to prove that you're truly saved or something like this. That gets put on me. It's not true. I don't believe that. I believe that there are a lot of people that are on the journey that are coming out of certain systems and they're, and they're still doing a lot of things wrong. But the, the safe haven for Bible-believing Christians is, you know, 
those that believe the King James Bible and stick with it. And so when I see people coming into that movement and trying to usurp this movement and trying to bring in all kinds of damnable heresies, like replacement theology, was Stephen Anderson teaching replacement theology, teaching against the pre-trib rapture. I mean, those things are very serious heresies, extremely serious heresies. You know, and these guys are bringing this stuff in to the body of Christ, and I'm going, whoa, I need to do something about this. So, you know, it's not going to overtake the ministry. It's not going to be like, I'm not going to do anything else. We're going to continue doing expository studies. We're going to continue doing subject studies, certainly. But I need to rebuke this stuff. I need to expose this stuff. And I thank the Lord when I see other brethren out there uh, bringing out some of these same things and bringing out uh, studies against Stephen Anderson. Um, Stephen Anderson is very dangerous and a lot more dangerous than people realize. And I do really do believe that he is tied in with this whole Illuminati structure. Uh, to what level? Still finding some of that stuff out. But i um, going to be bringing out more stuff, stuff on him in the future. But I hope that by now you've seen that the Hiles-Anderson whole system is corrupt. I mean, you know, from the coal mines to the gold mines. I mean, come on. You know? So that will be it for this study here. Uh, just please continue to keep us in your prayers. And, you know, there again, I will say this, and that is um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of ex exposés on different things and, and um, you know, come out against the Jesuits, come out against the Catholics. And I get people, you know, writing comments, nasty comments, and threatening to shut my channel down, or I'm going to report you and all this other stuff. But I've been attacked really, really hard twice now. Both times were times when I came out against Steven Anderson. And I mean, the first time I came out with, against Steven Anderson was back, um, well, I did my post-trib rapture thieves study years and years ago. And uh, that was just an audio sermon that I did for sermon audio. But then I came out with, you know, exposing each one of his post-trib moments and when that happened, while I was right in the middle of that project, my computer got hit with a cyber attack, and it just wiped out my computer. I had to, to restart everything. I had to go back in and crash the system and rebuild it from scratch. And <clears throat> so that happened. Now, this past time that I came out and showed that Stephen Anderson is teaching replacement theology, uh, his little goons just came on and just went wild, and I'm sure they're going to go wild with this video and the ones I'm going to be bringing out soon on Steven Anderson. And uh, they just went crazy, and I started to have this, uh, these people impersonate me. And I took action against it. I mean, I went through the whole process of, you know, I scanned the picture of my driver's license and everything, you know, blacked out the vital information on it. But I sent it to Google, and I said, they're impersonating me. I want to take legal action. I got an uh, email back from Google saying, oh, this person has um, deleted their account. We can't do anything now. Really? You know? Oh, he just, you know, the, the guy just kind of disappeared and we don't know how to find him. Sure you don't. Yeah, right. You know. So what am I expecting? Oh, I'm expecting some more attacks. You know, maybe this will get my channel shut down. I don't know. I have no idea, but I trust the Lord. I know that the Lord wants me to do this. I know the Lord wants me to bring this information out because you can teach people the Bible and, and show people Scripture and everything else and lead them in the right way, and all it takes is some false prophet that comes along that has a lying spirit, and Stephen Anderson has a lying spirit. Martin Richling has a lying spirit. I've seen these guys. They can take Scripture. I mean... Some of you out there, my, my brothers in Christ, we have our disagreements. Some of you are for Dr. Ruckman. Some of you are against Dr. Ruckman. Some of you, we have issues on the thing of repentance and, and, and what's the timing of repentance, what's what, you know, the thing of salvation and, and blah, blah. Some people disagree with some of my stands you know, on whatever. You know, we have our issues back and forth. But I still consider you saved, and a lot of you still consider me saved. Whatever. Like, that's fine. We can have our disagreements. But when you have somebody like Stephen Anderson and he takes scripture and he just twists it and tweaks it and, and changes it and then claims to be a King James Bible believer, which I'm going to be showing coming up here in the future, he changes the text 
and twists it. Unreal. Unreal. It's a lying spirit. And you have people that are going along in the truth and they'll listen to some guy with a lying spirit and those devil spirits are very persuasive. Extremely persuasive. They'll, they'll be very charismatic speaking through somebody and they will start to confuse you. I mean, I've been watching hours and hours and hours of Steven Anderson's videos for my studies, which I'm going to be coming out with. And it's, it's after a while, I'm just like, it's, it's leading my mind into confusion. And I'm just going, he makes so many lies and so many false points, I just start to lose track of it after a while. You know? And you watch Steven Anderson for, for a while as a Bible believer, and you start getting tired and just like, this doesn't even make any sense anymore. And that's the whole point. It's not the Holy Spirit leading him. It's a devil spirit, a lying spirit. So, Again, I don't want to give it away what I'm going to be coming out with, but it, watch in the next week or two, Lord willing, I'm going to be coming out with uh, a couple videos that are going to have some interesting information in them. So, enough yapping. Um, <clears throat> thank you for watching, and uh, keep please keep us in your prayers. Uh, the battle's going to heat up here quite a bit. I'm um, going to be bringing out some pretty crazy stuff. So, that's going to be it. Thank you for watching. And we will see you in the next video.